Good. A very good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all the participants. Please accept our greetings based on your time zone. My name is Rajiv Varshne. I'm a research program director, accelerated crop improvement program at International Crops Research Institute for the semi arid tropics, in short, ICRISAT. I'm a principal organizer of this event and also joined by my colleagues and directors for different programs, Dr. Ravi Harawa, Dr. Ramjita Tevo, Dr. Anthony Whitbread and Michael Hauser, who are the co-organizers of this event. We are very much excited to see this eminent uh, panel of very accomplished scientists and policy makers, research leaders and administrators as the panelists for this session. On behalf of ICRISAT and all organizers, I welcome you all in today's panel discussion, enabling food and nutrition security in drylands, which I'm sure will be a thought provoking experience that will enrich all of us on the current status and way forward in the direction of food and nutrition security. Thanks to our eminent panelists who kindly accepted our invitation to share their wisdom and vision towards achieving food and nutrition security in the dryland regions in particular and across the globe in general. To give you the rationale behind our today's discussion, I would like to mention the FAO report, which highlights that in the recent years, several major drivers have put the world off track to ending world hunger and malnutrition in all its forms by 2030. And the challenges have grown with the COVID-19 pandemic and related containment measures. This year, the FAO report, the state of food security and nutrition in the world 2021 estimates that between 720 and 811 million people in the world faced hunger in 2020, as many as 116 million more than in 2019. Nearly 2.37 billion people did not have access to educate food in 2020, an increase of 320 million people in just one year. Roughly 2.5 billion people, 30% of the world's population live in the dryland areas, which cover more than 40% of the world's land surface. And in these regions, we have scarcity of natural resources, land degradation, and frequent droughts that severely challenge food production in these areas. Dry land areas are most common in Africa and Asia. For example, in the Sahel regions in Africa where Ikrisat and many organizations work and almost all of the Middle East. Productivity in dry land regions face a multitude of challenges, persistent water scarcity, frequent droughts, high climatic variability, various forms of land degradation, including desertification and loss of biodiversity. Unfortunately, no region of the world has been spared. The high cost of healthy diets and persistently high levels of poverty and income inequality continue to keep healthy diets out of reach for around 3 billion people in every region of the world. Moreover, new analysis from the report shows that the increase in the unaffordability of healthy diets is associated with the higher levels of moderate or severe food insecurity. Therefore, ICRI said, thought to organize this panel session as a side event of the World Food Prize Foundation's Dej Borlaug Lecture. And our panel session is an effort to underline the urgency to enhance global efforts and define a roadmap for the, for the international community to work in this direction. I'm very happy to share that we have received overwhelming response to our call for registration with more than 1,500 registrations from 65 plus countries. And these countries, if you say the top 10 countries, they include India, United States, UK, Kenya, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Tanzania, Burkina Faso, Mali, and Zimbabwe. So I'm sure that we are going to have really a fantastic session. And many people have joined on this Zoom, as well as I can see larger number of people on the YouTube as well. So now let's start the session. And in this regard, 
as we know that international investment is very important to address this important issue. Dr. Julian Bedel from Australian Center for International Agriculture Research, ACIR, will share perspective as an international donor. And her name is known to all of us, but very briefly, Dr. Bedel is a director, multilateral engagement with ACIR. She has oversight of partnerships with CGIR, Kavi, the Pacific Community, World Vegetable Center, Asia Pacific Association of Agriculture Research Institutions, APARI, Global Research Alliance on Agriculture, Agricultural Greenhouse Gases, GRA, etc. So thanks very much, Julianne, for joining us. And we would look forward to receive or to, to hear your perspective on this important topic. Floor is yours, Julianne, please. Thank you. I'll just share my screen. Can you see my slides? Yes, Julian, you're all set, please. Great. So before I dive into um, the donor perspectives that I'm going to share today, I'd, I'd like to share some insights about why drylands research is important for Australians and our approaches to this type of work. So Australia is the driest inhabited continent in the world. Um, degradation is common and most crop production is in dryland regions. Australian farmers have greater annual volatility in yield and price than many other farmers around the world. And in addition to this, Australian farmers face the tyranny of distance. The vast size of Australia and concentration of cities to coastal areas means that farmers face transport costs for inputs and transport costs to get produce to market. And finding workers in regional areas can be difficult. This enormous, enormously variable environment means that Australia has a long history of domestic drylands research. Improved water use efficiency, precision and conservation agriculture have been key for more productive agricultural systems in Australia. In 1982, it was recognised that Australian agricultural researchers had ideas they could share with other countries operating in similar conditions and learnings we could bring back to Australia and Australian food systems. So ACR was formed. So what does ACR do? Well, our vision is to reduce poverty and improve livelihoods through more productive and sustainable agriculture, emerging from collaborative international research. ACR brokers and invests in research partnerships to build the knowledge base of low and lower middle income countries to improve food security and reduce poverty, better manage natural resources and food production, and enhance human nutrition and reduce risks to human health. While working on these objectives, we ensure that our research pays attention in particular to gender equality and empowerment of women and girls more inclusive agri-food and forestry market chains and scientific and policy capability. And as um, was said earlier, um, globally we are facing diabolical challenges associated with nutrition, poverty, population growth, disease, conflict, migration and inequality. But drylands have these challenges plus some unique problems connected with their unique conditions of distance, soil moisture content, climatic constraints, low and infrequent rainfall and high solar radiation. These conditions mean that dryland livelihoods are constantly vulnerable. At ACR, we share the deep global concern regarding the current state of drylands, particularly in the face of climate change. The key question for us is how can we neutralize human impacts on climate and land in these regions to achieve sustainable dryland management into the future. We do this directly through research projects. These are two recent examples of ACR's work in Afghanistan. The first project resulted in increased catchment productivity, made dryland areas more productive and improved rural li livelihoods. And the second project developed economically viable and sustainable forage production systems to reduce winter feed gaps in water constrained provinces. But looking beyond this, ACR's most significant contribution to drylands research to date has been through our partnership with the CGIAR. Every year, ACR contributes a large proportion of its budget to global research initiatives led by the CGIAR. 
Why the CGIAR? Because we recognise how vital global collaboration is in solving our greatest challenges. At the minimum, there are two messages that I would like you to take away from my presentation. These are on partnership and gender. I'll speak about gender in the next slide. Partnership is our bread and butter at ACR, meaning it's at the heart of everything that we do. Global collaboration is even more important now than it ever has been before as we face 2030, asking ourselves how we're going to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals. I believe the only way for us to achieve the SDGs is for us to work together, not on our own. For this, we desperately need to foster the right types of global partnerships. We need to be able to share and build on collective knowledge. We need to build on the experience of all partners to ensure transformation of dry land agriculture. We need systems approaches that link rural, rural communities, all levels of government, natural resource management, production, inclusive value chains, rural businesses, and other areas for economic growth. The right type of partnerships help validate, build and extend our ideas. They make our dollars go further. They share the load. They allow research to have impact in places where we wouldn't normally have reach. And they allow us to go beyond our normal risk profile. But partnerships can be difficult to establish and maintain and have high transaction costs. Many organisations like ACR aspire to do more with and through partnerships, but knowing the key components for success, even more importantly, how to ensure impact through partnership can be extremely tricky. A stock taking report on donor contributions to food systems published by the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development argues for the critical need for coordination of donor funding and initiatives to effectively work on food systems that we need measured and well-planned approaches to investment activities. We've all seen the benefits that flow from global collaboration, and we're always looking for ways to improve our partnership-based research. We want to use partnerships as tools to deliver and implement game-changing research for agricultural development for the benefit of dry lands and other agri-food systems. And now on gender. ACR supports researchers to incorporate gender into every activity that they do. And ACR invests in gender research, but we all need to do more. The recently released Global Food 5050 report on gender diversity and power in the global food system reviews the gender and equity related policies and practices of 52 organizations active in food systems, including donors and research organizations. In brief, it found that organizational commitment to gender equality is high and that over half the organizations are transparent about their policies for shaping diverse, inclusive working environments. But it looks like this is being used as a substitute for action. As organizational leadership, CEOs and board chairs remain disproportionately male and dominated by European and North American nationals. The report found that gender as a key social dynamic that influences opportunity, access, and power in global food systems remains underappreciated, undercounted, and underaddressed. Another study authored in 2020 by the CGIR demonstrates the often undervalued and hidden contribution that women make to rural dryland farming practices and the importance of building women's resilience to the impacts of COVID-19 now and after through better transport, consistent and affordable supplies of feedstock and other agricultural inputs, digital access and support for domestic issues like strengthening the resilience of households and whole communities. With the global resurgence of COVID-19, now more than ever, we need to make sure we do not overlook what women are already offering and empower them to do more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian, for very nice presentation of your interventions and you, you highlighted many areas. But I think this is really good to see that global partnership is really essential and gender plays a very, very important role for this important topic. Thank you very much for your time. And I know that in Australia you are having late evening, but you are up. Thank you very much for that. So, but again, thank you for your commitment and also ACIR's commitment. 
Now I think we would like to move on to the next panelist. And uh, we have Dr. Yemi Akin Bamijo, who is the Executive Director of the Forum for Agricultural Research in Africa. In short, we call it FARA, which has a continent-wide mandate on the coordination of agricultural research for development in Africa. Prior to his appointment as the Executive Director of FARA in 2013, Yemi was the Head of Agriculture and Food Security Division at the African Union Commissions. Thanks very much, Yemi, for joining us. We would like to request you to share your perspective on this important topic. Yemi, floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, uh, Rajiv. Is my screen visible? Yes. We can hear you. Your screen is also coming. So I think should be all right. It's taking a while. Something gone wrong. We are having the black screen. Double, yes. I, I think you should be able to see my screen now. We can see the last slide and not in the slide representation mode. You please give another try. Otherwise, I will ask Neil. Yes, yes, this yes. is good. Thank you. Thank you, Yami. Yes. Okay. So thank you very much, Rajiv. And uh, warm greetings to all participants from across the globe. Depending on where you are, greetings from Accra, Ghana. As um, introduced, my name is Yemi Akimbamijo, and it's a great pleasure and honor to be able to be a part of the conversation um, this morning at the normal Bolog World Food Prize event at the side event by uh, Ikrisat. So I'm going to start by just looking at the contextual frame, which is what I have on my screen at the moment, and to see that the dry land um, on a global scale is a very, very important element of the global ecosystem. We have about 6.5 million um, square kilometers of dry land. That's quite significant. And 90% of these dry land populations are in the developing countries, as you can see. And you'll find that many of these um, dry lands, they have high levels, as um, Rajiv mentioned in his introduction, of physical degradation, high levels of hunger, incidences of um, physical degradation, poverty, and so on. So when you look at the African context, drawing closer, you find that in Africa, we have about more than 50% of the African scenario is arid and semi-arid drylands. And if I pick on a particular country, Kenya, Kenya okay, has more than 75% of its arable land classified as arid and semi-arid. So that is just to give an, 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 a bird's eye view of how significant the dry lands can be when it comes to um, Africa and in a global perspective. So this is a very, very significant part of our ecosystem that we're looking at. The population in these geographic scope largely also depend on agriculture. But as I said earlier on, the ecological fragility of these um, ecosystem is also underpinned by the type of climate that, um, that they have. But what is also, um, what I describe as the double whammy there is when you look at the the geographic space where the, the ecological descriptors are very harsh, um, having hunger, 
having malnutrition, having very, very extreme physical climatic conditions, they are also overlaid with political conflicts. So this for me is what I describe as a double whammy. You have fragile ecosystem and you have conflict. Now these two don't go well for development, for good livelihoods. It is a cause for concern, ecological concern, political concern, it is a cause for concern. So when we are talking about enabling nutrition security of the drylands, there are the odds against us are quite significant from the political side and from the ecological side. So, so it was so important that the theme of the African Union in 2020 was silencing the guns, making sure that we have a peaceful and a, a, a secure Africa. So that is just, you know, putting the frame of the situation. Now, if you want to put it in a very stylistic mode, you know, you can say that um, you, you're looking at the fragility of the, of the system uh, and that is underpinned by the climate and the very difficult environmental situations and scenarios of the arid lands. And then you're looking at how the, 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 the fragility leads to instability and competition for natural resources and also the unfortunate scenario of poor nutrition security. And then you come to the situation where you have both biotic and abiotic shocks, the involuntary and voluntary migrations and all sorts of conflicts between herders, pastoralists, livestock dependent communities and all of these people, all of this coming into, um, into a conflagration and then you come to the cycle having a fragile ecosystem, having instabilities and all of that. So, but then to address all of these, uh, the, there have been social political frames that are put in place. And these include, like uh, Julian mentioned earlier on, the SDGs, the Agenda 2063 of the African Union, the Malabo declarations, the Maputo, um, CADEP, the CISA, the PIDA, all of these put together, they are focusing on having a dry land ecosystem that must be given the desired attention to be able to have what is called the food secure Africa. So on a political front, there are a lot of initiatives that are geared towards keeping Africa and its dry lands food secure. But then let me come very quickly to um, what I describe as the hole in the bucket or the holes in plural. And this leads me to the consequences of the low institutional and systemic capacities to be able to respond to shocks. And what do you see? You find, as I mentioned before, the biotic and abiotic stresses, you have the degraded soils to cope with, you have the poor precipitations with maximum 300 millimeters of rainfall in a year, if, if, if you reach that, very scanty surface water that is um, very, very insufficient to drive pastoral communities and their livestock, uh, poor policy interventions and very poor agronomic practices. So with all of these gamut of what I call the, the, the odds that are against the arid and semi-arid dry land, what do you need? You must then work to what I call turn the tide. Now, how do you turn the tide to be able to have a food secure, semi-arid and semi-arid or dry lands, um, uh, to have a food secure dry lands? This is where the power of science comes in. Now, in looking at the power of science, and ICRISAT is doing a phenomenal job at that, um, in the area of genomics um, and genetics, uh, genetic advancements and genetic manipulation in crops and livestock to be able to respond to the shocks or the holes that I mentioned earlier on. And then 
You also look at advances in, in, in forage agronomy, especially the great work being done by Ilri. We just uh, wrapped up what is called the In of Africa, where a lot of work has been done on forage agronomy. And you look on the, on the other slide with a lot of biofortified crops, maize, sweet potato, cassava, and the, the whole lot of um, millets and, 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 and the likes of the wheat, the rice, that are coming out of the work of the CG and what you also do with efficiency of the natural resource, uh, the natural resource management. And then um, there are key intervention areas in the dry lands, having healthy and sustainable food systems, having circular approaches. And as I said earlier on, the very good work of um, exercise on smart food, Ikarda, Seals, Agrimet, Walik, Sirius, and all the nurse put together, having um, working out how to deal with the big question of nutrition of the arid and semi arid areas. So, the big issues are on this slide. I will not attempt to run through them, but just to flash that there are big issues that underpin the nutrition security of the dry land. So to be able to really run through the whole gamut of what I call the big holes of the, of the, of the, of the, um, the challenges confronting the dry lands, you will have to deal with these big issues as well. Now, in closing, partnership and partnerships, just like um, Julian said, you no one institution can do this. So what we've seen in Africa, uh, just name a few of what I describe as the partnership frameworks that are looking at how to resolve these issues around the enabling factors for nutrition of the dry lands. So we have the LEAP for FNSSA, which is the long-term EU, AU research and partnership and innovation partnership. And we have the DESIRA, which is all both of them from the European Commission. And we have the outcome of the COP26 that is just going, to, um, going to, to, to be rolled out. And of course, on the continent is a major player, the African Development Bank with the Technologies for African Agricultural Transformation and many others, too numerous for me to be enumerated. And then of course, the big message is to leave no one behind. On this note, I return to you, um, Rajiv, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Yemi, for very nice presentation and very elegantly highlighting the different issues. And I like this thing, turn the tide and no one should be lagging behind. I think this is what we need when we are talking about this important topic. So I think thanks a lot, Yemi, once again for all these interventions. Now we would like to move on to the next panelist, Dr. Jane Ininda, and she is the head of the Seed Research and Systems Development Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, in short, this is called AGRA. She has 30 years plus experience in African seed systems of Eastern, Southern, West Africa, and in post-conflict countries of uh, DR Congo, South Sudan, etc. She has designed and directed plant breeding interventions in Africa program that resulted in development and release of more than seven, 680 crop varieties now commercialized in Africa through local private seed companies. And we all know seed is the starting point when we were talking about agriculture, especially in the crop perspective. So I think that we would like to request now Jane for giving her presentation. Nilesh, you would be opening the slides. So and Jane, please, floor is yours, Jane. Thank you very much and welcome everyone. Uh, and I'm very glad to be a panelist in this discussion. Uh, we can have the slides please in the presentation mode if possible. So I work with ANGRA, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa. ANGRA focuses on um, three areas. One of them is system development, partnerships and country support. And uh, under the area of system development, this way as seed systems fall, others are, we also work on markets 
uh, inclusive financing, um, farmer awareness and distribution. And today I'm going to really focus my talk around seed. We can have the next slide. So as we all know that seed is one of the critical elements that is uh, important in terms of crop productivity. When we look at the challenges that we are dealing with in Africa, as has been clearly articulated by my previous speakers, our the three challenges that we are really focusing on is to ensure that we have um, hunger and poverty reduced, um, we would also want to in, include um, nutritional security, and uh, we also want to make sure that farmers have incomes. But when you look at the challenges that we are actually addressing in the seed systems, I, I just put up this slide, uh, which is just a view of how we view the seed system in Africa and the, and the differences that are happening in the continent. As my previous speakers have said, we know that seed is actually one of the system elements that if we can resolve, we would be able to increase productivity. But when you look at the seed system across all the countries that are, we are operating in Africa, not just Angra, but also where ICRIS that is operating, we know that there are those elements that drive the seed system, including our farmers getting the right kind of varieties, is the seed of early generation seed and certified seed being produced, are the seed companies being empowered, um, are farmers having uh, enough information, farmer awareness? Uh, well, how about the seed markets? How about our policy environment? And uh, also quality control in terms of seed. And I put up this slide just to show you a picture of what is happening at least in the 11 countries where we are working. And what I'm showing here is actually what we call the seed, the seed system gaps in these areas. Uh, we can um, uh, uh, conclude that the greener it is, the better, and that's why you can see some countries, they have relatively good systems, but the more red it is, it means that there is a lot of work which needs to be done to put these structures in place. So what we are seeing here is that we have a big challenge when it comes to meeting and ensuring that we have farmers who are food secure, their, nutritious, uh, they, they, their, their nutrition is enhanced and they have higher incomes. Next slide, please. So with, um, uh, uh, in relation to our topic today, and I really congratulate ICRISAT for the work that uh, I think it's moving. Can we just go back? For the work that they are doing, the, next, the previous slide, please. The work that they are doing on dry land crops and green legumes. We know that these crops are very, very important in terms of nutrition, access to minerals, ensuring that protein content, digestibility, they resolve health issues, and um, chickpea, sorghum, finger millet, you know, groundnuts, pigeon peas, and even pow millet. These are very, very, very important crops which need to be equally emphasized, especially if we have to increase the productivity and enhance nutrition for the farmers. For example, you will find that there is a lot of work on uh, crops like hybrid maize, and uh, I do uh, recognize the work of uh, CEMIT, for example, and even ANGRA and other partners in ensuring that our private seed companies can produce hybrid maize. But we know that these are the crops which bring a lot of balance. And so I think just to say that the work that ICRISAT has really done on this really is work that actually enhances the nutritional balance and also ensures food security. However, next slide, please. We find that these crops, their attention is lagging behind. We can go to the next slide. Uh, in terms of getting access, you know, to these crops. I've just said one of the experiences that we have found is there's a lot of emphasis on crops that make business like hybrid maize. And I was just showing this slide here. This is actually Angra data on what, how our seed companies performing in ensuring that uh, seed of, uh, of high yielding crops get to the farmers. But as you can see, 
uh, a lot of seed production is on uh, cereals, but even among the cereals, actually almost 90% of the total seed you find is almost on maize. And sorghum and millets only contribute maybe to the 4% and of the seed of all the cereals. Then you find legumes. They are only contributing to 12%. So what I want to say here is that there is a huge gap. And this is why we really need to invest and support uh, the organizations like the work that Tick Research is doing to ensure that we are able to move, you know, these better varieties and also partner with other organizations like working with seed companies like what Angra has done to ensure that seed of these varieties actually gets to the farmers. Next. Um, so again, uh, uh, just to, to say that one, the key entry point in ensuring nutri nutritional security is to start with good seed. And when it, we talk about good seed, uh, our goal in Angra is to ensure that uh, farmers get access to this good seed and the seed is available and it's also accessible, meaning that it's available at the right place, at the right cost, um, and farmers are also able to move shorter distances. And of all the uh, elements that I've talked about, you know, policy from policy, from crop breeding, uh, production, farmers awareness, all these uh, elements need to be approached uh, inclusively, you know, holistically. Because what we have seen is that sometimes uh, there is a tendency of uh, uh, us, development partners and other organizations to focus on one area of the seed system. But it really needs to be very inclusive so that we can have a comprehensive functional seed system, which we will then contribute to farmers accessing the best varieties in real time. And this will contribute greatly to increased productivity. Next slide. Uh, so in the areas of um, uh, our, uh, what I can say about the approach that I would propose to nutritional security is to ensure that um, we do what we call nutrition sensitive, let me say agriculture or investments where we will target breeding, variety release, commercialization, uh, certified seed production and distribution, especially of these nutrient rich crops for the drylands. I'm talking about sorghum millets, groundnuts. Uh, we have, we need breed, breeding which is oriented, you know, to make sure that farmers access this diversity in real time. Um, the second thing that I would propose is that we need to expand on the models which we have been working with uh, in ensuring that seed of this, this diverse crops, not just focusing on hybrid bees, reaches women, youth, and disadvantaged group. Uh, we will find that another thing is the streamlining of seed systems in the dry land because uh, these are crops which you find that there's a lot of informal seed production taking place. But what we can do is to support, you know, efforts in this, in the research, in the seed system, so that these crops can also have the right um, uh, attention in, so that the farmers can be able to get that diversity which need to benefit them. Uh, you will also find that policies are uh, very, government policies are very, uh, let me say, biased to us, what we call high, uh, high value crops, um, in quotes, like maize, because they make more business. But you'll find that policies which, re which relate, you know, to uh, legumes and uh, those crops of the drylands are not up to speed. So there's a lot of work which really needs to be done in the, that area. And the other, the last thing is connecting the farmers to market, because obviously farmers will not produce unless, or, okay, they will produce for food security, but the excess needs to get into the market. Next slide, please. So uh, basically what, uh, what, what we need is that change at the farmer level, at the government level and the private sector level that ensures that you know farmers are having that diversity. 
Uh, farmers are accessing the seed of those adapted uh, crops in real time and at a cost that they can afford. And that at the government level, the policies are very well set so that these policies support the framework and they support, you know, enabling the healthy seed production of these crops. Uh, at the private sector level, you find that just as I've said, there are very few private seed companies which are, uh, are handling these uh, crops, but the seed company are constrained because of different challenges that are on the ground, including even liberalization for their operations, support in financing, and supporting in models which can work, particularly for these crops. Uh, next. Thank you very much. Uh, that's all I had for you. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Jane, for very nicely highlighting the role of the seed system and also that how Agra has been working with the international organizations like ICRISAT. And as you mentioned about the seeds, I think this is really the key thing when we would like to make some interventions in agriculture. And uh, I'm also very much pleased to share that ICRISAT won the Africa Food Prize for 2021 and I think that was for that ICRISATs and the other international centers like IIT, SCAT and 13 national programs in Africa for their work for about 12 years through the Tropical Legumes Project, which was funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And under that project, all partners, they developed about 266 improved legume varieties and almost half a million ton of seeds for several legume crops, including cowpea, pigeon pea, chickpea, common bean, groundnut, and soya bean. And these new varieties have helped more than 25 million smallholder farmers. So this is the beauty, that the importance of the seeds. And at personal note, I feel privileged to lead this project for seven out of 12 years from the tropical legume project. So this was really very remarkable. Anyway, thank you very much, Jane, for joining us and for sharing your perspectives on the seed systems, especially. Now, I think we would like to, after hearing the challenges and perspectives from the Africa continents, we would like to move to India, a country with more than 1.3 billion people. And as they say, India is a success story from the agriculture perspective. Total grain production has a miracle growth from 50 million tons from 1950 to the record food grain production of 309 million tons this year. And this includes record production of three cereal crops, in like 122 million tons of rice, 110 million tons wheat, 32 million tons maize, and record production of 24 million ton pulses. And this miracle has been possible due to a strong foundation in agriculture research and extension system, hard work of farmers, research by agricultural scientists, and farmer-friendly policies of the government. And we are very much pleased to have the leader of this agriculture system, Dr. Trilochan Mohopatra with us. Dr. Mohopatra is the Secretary, Department of Agriculture Research and Education and the Director General of Indian Council of Agriculture Research, Government of India. He is a well-accomplished scientist and an able research leader and policy maker. And we are very much pleased to have Dr. Mohopatra with us. May I request you, sir, to please share your views and perspective from India that how the government of India and your department can contribute or is contributing in this direction. So floor is yours, Dr. Mopatra, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rajiv Ashni, uh, the other panelists, uh, speakers uh, in this program, Dr. Yemi, Dr. Giuliano, Dr. Jain, Dr. Arvind Kumar, and uh, other co organizers from Ekrishat, uh, all the participants uh, who are attending this program online. Uh, at the outset, let me thank uh, Dr. Rajiv Varshni for organizing this uh, particular program under the World Food Prize uh, Foundation's uh, 2021 International Bullock uh, Dialogues, Dialogue, uh, and uh, also giving us, uh, for giving us, or me uh, particularly, this opportunity 
opportunity uh, to be associated with uh, this program, uh, which is uh, aptly uh, deliberating on enabling food and nutritional security in dry lands. Uh, world uh, is uh, the very uh, existence of civilization uh, uh, has been uh, seriously threatened by uh, COVID-19. Uh, more than one and a half years, uh, we are uh, suffering, we have been suffering, uh, and uh, uh, most countries, uh, the, uh, the seriousness of this uh, is uh, already, uh, you know, very well known to all of us and how it has impacted the livelihoods, uh, particularly uh, in, you know, in uh, countries uh, having uh, limited resources, uh, that is known to us. Uh, we always say that uh, uh, the calamities uh, of this dimension, and particularly that uh, touches uh, every a uh, nook and corner of the world uh, has uh, many implications. And in that context, uh, uh, the whole world is uh, in fact working in the direction of using science and technologies uh, to provide solutions uh, to uh, this uh, uh, serious uh, threat. Uh, while uh, we, uh, the world is working on that, uh, uh, we cannot forget the challenges on the food front and food and nutrition security uh, is of paramount importance uh, for our own uh, uh, sustenance, uh, our own existence, and also uh, for livelihood security of millions uh, uh, of uh, smallholder farmers. Uh, so food security and livelihood security and also nutrition security, uh, all are so intricately uh, linked. And when we uh, talk of uh, threats like COVID-19 and the food systems, uh, nutrition uh, outcomes, uh, as well as livelihood, uh, all are uh, at uh, uh, you know, kind of risks and tremendous uh, threats uh, that we see, and more so uh, uh, the regions uh, which uh, are uh, classified as uh, dry lands. Uh, I'm not going to those definitions, uh, what are called dry lands, but we very well know that where are these uh, dry land regions and uh, countries having majority of uh, uh, areas. It is one estimate says, almost uh, uh, 2 billion people, almost 41% of uh, global population uh, living uh, in dry land areas of the world. And uh, these uh, 2 billion uh, people living in these uh, dry land regions of the world are far more threatened, uh, primarily because of the fragility of the uh, production system. And uh, when the food uh, uh, production uh, is not adequate, and uh, in fact, there are many challenges, uh, challenges uh, due to uh, limited rainfall primarily, and then subsequently, uh, you know, that is coupled with uh, many other associated problems. Uh, uh, and as we see in India, uh, also elsewhere uh, in the world, uh, that the uh, low carbon, uh, you know, and high level of degradation of the soils uh, in these uh, regions. Uh, so that makes production systems, uh, you know, unsustainable uh, and they're quite uh, threatened, uh, you know, uh, and uh, obviously uh, the nutrition and livelihood securities are uh, very much threatened. Uh, the, in, and, and because uh, the rainfall is uh, low and uh, uncertain uh, and uh, every, uh, you know, agricultural operations uh, uh, is dependent on water. Uh, so obviously, largely monocropping uh, is uh, also followed. So that adds uh, another, uh, you know, uh, kind of complexity to the whole uh, issue. 
uh, of uh, you know sustaining uh, in fact uh, human population uh, and providing adequate uh, you know amount of nutritious food uh, to the people living in these uh, dry lands uh the uh, 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 the in case of uh, indian uh, indian situation uh, you know we have about uh, 52% of our uh, you know total 140 41 million hectares uh, uh, classified as uh, dry lands uh, and then uh, you know that is about uh, 70 around 72 million hectares and that's a big chunk of area and many states uh, indian states uh, you know, having a large chunk of areas, uh, you know, falling under uh, dry lands. Uh, I, and uh, uh, this, uh, uh, in fact, uh, belonging to whether it is arid, uh, semi-arid, uh, dry subhumid, and so on and so forth, and uh, all these classifications and uh, has been done. Uh, and accordingly, uh, you know, uh, efforts are being made to address the challenges, uh, as I uh, mentioned. And similar would be the situation elsewhere uh, across the globe, that uh, how uh, the challenges of these regions are being addressed. Uh, when I say uh, that uh, uh, we in India are trying to face this challenge, the Indian Council of Agriculture Research, which was established uh, in the year 1929, and uh, in another uh, uh, eight years, it is going to celebrate 100 years of its uh, existence. Uh, 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 it has uh, the organization along with the state agriculture universities and uh, central uh, agriculture universities uh, and uh, a central university with agriculture faculty, which is about 74 of them. And uh, together, uh, uh, it constitutes the national agricultural uh, research system what we call as a NARS. Uh, and uh, uh, the uh, Indian Council of Agriculture Research with 113 uh, institutions uh, spread all across the country and uh, 725 farm science centers, one in every district of the country. Uh, they, they form the National Agriculture Research uh, uh, Education and Extension System, uh, the university system, the research institutions, the farm science centers, all together constitute a huge mega a national agricultural research, education and extension system. And this system has been striving hard to meet the challenges. And that is how India, you know, who, who, who was borrowing, uh, you know, or primarily the food grains, and uh, you know, uh, uh, during 1950s and 60s, uh, has become self-sufficient uh, in producing enough quantity of food. And uh, as it was said by Dr. Rajiv, so uh, not only that, uh, we have uh, you know uh, provided adequate food uh, to the 1.3 billion plus population. We are also exporting, uh, uh, and uh, uh, so that is what is uh, very, very uh, important that uh, the technology uh, has been developed, uh, they have gone to the field, uh, and uh, also, uh, uh, more importantly, farmers have adopted and the production has increased via increase in productivity, uh, and we are able to sustain this population and also export. Uh, we have deficiency with regard to edible oils, with, resp with, re with regard to pulses, uh, we have also uh, a certain level of deficiency, not as much as in case of edible oils, but uh, in case of food grains, uh, we have uh, become self-sufficient. Uh, what is being discussed today uh, is, uh, you know, under uh, uh, 2021 International Borlaug uh, Dialogue, uh, you know, that uh, uh, we are in, and uh, when we talk of uh, Dr. Normal Bowler, uh, we remember him in this country uh, pretty much, uh, and everyone knows his name, those who are in this arena, because of the Green Revolution. Uh, you know, that was initiated those days uh, through intervention of Dr. Bowler by way of introducing semi dwarf file yielding varieties of wheat. And, uh, you know, that was the starting point of, uh, in, in fact, uh, igniting 
uh, that spark uh, which was required in the country. And uh, subsequently, uh, what we have is a history. And uh, not that we had only Green Revolution, we had the White Revolution, and subsequently many other revolutions. And in recent times, we have Pulses Revolution and a Sugar Revolution. And we are able to produce uh, you know, uh, more than 30 million tons of sugar. And our requirement is about 25 million tons. And uh, that's the reason why we are diverting sugar uh, and uh, sugar cane juice uh, uh, to produce bioethanol. Uh, anyway, I'll not go into those details very briefly, focusing on the topic that how do we enable food and nutritional secu nutrition security uh, in dry lands? As I say, uh, you know, our uh, you know, challenges are uh, well known. The strategies uh, are now defined and designed to meet these challenges. Uh, the dry land ecology have uh, its specific crops. In fact, the ecocide's mandate crops uh, are uh, very much uh, known to all of us. And we focus on those crops as well. And uh, mention was made about the partnership. Uh, we have uh, you know, partnership with, for instance, uh, you know, 12 CG centers. We have a memorandum for agreements, understandings, and defined work plans. Uh, and we have a very thorough analysis of situations and work together uh, to uh, you know, meet the challenges. And ICRISAT uh, has been a valued partner uh, in this whole process uh, and developing tools and technologies, varieties and products to meet the challenges uh, in the dry land uh, ecosystem. So obviously, uh, you know, a major crop in dry land being uh, the millets. Uh, we have 14 million hectares of millet area and producing around uh, the similar, uh, you know, uh, kind of quantity, about 14 million tons uh, of uh, millets in this country. Uh, we all know that millets uh, being uh, nutritionally dense, uh, having uh, all the positives in terms of micronutrients. Uh, and also obviously, uh, you know, they should occupy uh, our plates. Uh, I know we, plates should be full of millet products, but slowly India forgot, and in fact, globally, globally also, uh, the, uh, you know, kind of uh, a preference that has gone in favor of, uh, you know, uh, cereals like wheat and rice. Uh, so, uh, so now we are trying to bring back the focus on millets, particularly to consumption and enhancing production by a productivity increase. Uh, so, uh, so that is our target. Uh, that how do we make millets uh, as our major food, uh, you know, items, uh, particularly uh, in dry land ecologies where uh, they are produced more. Uh, so. Uh, so the uh, uh, varietal development is one aspect of it, but uh, in recent years, we are focusing on biofortified millets. Millets were already reaching uh, uh, those uh, elements uh, of nutrition, but we have further biofortified them, enhanced their level so that the consumption of millets, uh, you know, leads to, uh, you know, better nutrition out outcomes, high iron uh, in calcium even, uh, in case of finger millet, for instance. Uh, finger millet is already rich in calcium and we have further enhanced it. And similarly, uh, you know, in pearl millet, we have set the baseline uh, that, uh, you know, below that benchmark, we are not going to develop any variety uh, in pearl millet, for instance. Uh, so, so with that benchmark, so the, the both, uh, you know, uh, newer varieties in pearl millet and all other millets, uh, you know, uh, would uh, serve uh, food and nutrition uh, purposes uh, in dry lands. Uh, so, so that is uh, the primary requirement. Uh, and similarly, in case of dry lands, we have uh, pulses. Uh, some of the you know pulse crops, uh, you know, particularly uh, in uh, you know or specific niche areas, uh, whether it is uh, uh, for its uh, uh, pigeon pea uh, or uh, even uh, groundnut. In some of those uh, dry land areas, uh, you know, uh, rain fed where rainfall is very little, so they are uh, they are being grown, and they are also mandated crops of ecrisat. So new variety development, nutritionally enriched varieties, they are serving the purpose. And uh, recently, Honorable Prime Minister, uh, you know, last year on the uh, World Food Day, dedicated 17 biofortified varieties to the country, and we have now more than 85 biofortified crop varieties released in India, 
and which are serving the purpose and which are now more than 4 million hectares are under biofortified crop varieties in the country. And uh, hopefully this area would increase. And uh, in another few years time, we should be having all the varieties biofortified uh, with regard to the nutrients for which they are now uh, you know, uh, uh, deficient. So, so in that, when that happens, so obviously uh, we don't have to create separate market chains or separate systems and uh, you know, uh, uh, promoting separately the biofortified crop varieties. So in dryland areas, very specifically, would be able to address both food and nutrition uh, security uh, you know, uh, by way of developing biofortified and high yielding uh, climate resilient crop varieties. And that's what Honorable Prime Minister uh, you know, released 35 varieties with special traits, uh, including climate resilience traits uh, to the nation recently on 28th of last month. Uh, so so uh, in brief, I would like to mention that this is one approach that, uh, you know, how new varieties are developed, uh, you know, by the National Agriculture Research System and uh, some of them through partnerships uh, with institutions, uh, CGIR institutions like ICRISAT, you know, that is how we are trying to meet the challenge. Uh, uh, but then uh, that's not the only challenge. So we need to really address the water issues so water harvesting and the government of India has a program and the prime minister has given calls for drop more crops. So storage of water and use of micro irrigation system. So that area is increasing more than uh, you know, 10 million hectares now under micro irrigation. So, so, so government support is there. Uh, so the schemes are there. So, so that is another way of addressing uh, the kind of uh, production issues and challenges under dryland ecologies, whatever uh, uh, you know, waterfalls. So the 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 uh, call is uh, the uh, harvest water uh, wherever it falls and whenever it falls, and that's the kind of slogan with which uh, the government of India is working and uh, trying to actually utilize every drop of water, uh, the rainwater, whenever it is falling and wherever it is falling. And I think this should give a big push. It has already brought a kind of paradigm shift in our thinking process. That is planning based on watersheds. So, so the old concept of watershed but the based planning and implementation is now at the forefront. And we should be able to really you know, address the challenges in the dry lands. In the dry lands, there are most vulnerable uh, districts and we have identified them, 150 villages we have identified and we have made them climate resilient villages. And we have, they have grown now into clusters and the technology intervention and uh, you know, climate risk management uh, village committees and further banks, seed banks, and many other interventions and large scale technology demonstrations and trainings which are happening. They are enabling these villages and we call them as climate resilient villages. So in the dry land system, if we want to really address the challenges, it cannot be just some crops and the monocropping system that would address the challenges in the dryland ecologies. We need to go for integration and cropping system mode operation. That's what is promoted through these climate resilient village platforms. So what is more important? We need to really address the income of the farmers in the dryland in addition to livelihood securities. So livelihood security and nutrition and food needs have to be met, squarely as I highlighted, but that's not really enough. What is important also that uh, how do we increase the income of the farmers in dryland ecologies, which is very challenging and fragile ecologies. And uh, there, Honorable Prime Minister has given the call, uh, Honorable Prime Minister of India has given the call that uh, doubling farmers' income. In fact, uh, you know, uh, that's our endeavor to double and or go beyond doubling farmers' income. And that is possible, and we have demonstrated, if we integrate crop system with the animal husbandry system, and uh, field crops as well as horticulture crops if they are integrated. In case of horticulture crops, our focus is on, we have identified several crop species and, uh, uh, and that is what we are focusing on, the, the vegetable crops, uh, the uh, spices, uh, the fruit crops, and all together, uh, these are now uh, you know, uh, earmarked uh, to be actually cultivated in these regions so that we are able to uh, address uh, the uh, problems uh, of income, low income. Uh, 13 uh, fruit crops, including bear, aula, uh, and then pomegranate, 
and many others. Uh, I'll not go into those details. 19 vegetables which you have identified for dryland ecologies, which can go along with the field crops like the millets and other field crops. And uh, similarly, seven uh, you know, spices, including coriander, cumin, and, uh, and uh, three medicinal plants, and which you have identified and they are being promoted in a cropping system mode and intercropping mode, uh, some fruit crops with some vegetable crops, so that the income of the farmers are doubled at least. And that is what has been demonstrated large scale in many areas. Uh, not only that, uh, you know, very importantly, we are exporting, for instance, the pomegranate, uh, the, uh, the one variety which we developed called Bhagwa, and that has occupied, uh, you know, 85% of the area. And, uh, you know, recent publications, you can see one in nature and how the uh, consumption of pomegranate can address many issues uh, of nutrition as well as uh, health. Uh, so I'll not go into further details, but in addition to this, we are promoting a small ruminant agriculture in dry lands uh, in an integrated fashion. And particularly the goat and camel, they are all known very much, and sheep, they are known very much in uh, to be uh, surviving, thriving well in dry land ecology, in arid ecology, for instance, and very uh, you know severe uh, kind of, uh, of uh, situations, they thrive. And also very importantly, we have characterized their milk and the way they uh, provide uh, nutrition and also health benefits, uh, you know, that has been already established uh, globally and also nationally. And that is what we are promoting. And we have actually uh, registered and ident identified uh, several breeds uh, of uh, these uh, uh, animals, uh, 34 breeds of goats, and uh, some of them thriving very well on dryland ecology situations like, uh, you know, Sirohi breed, uh, in Rajasthan, arid ecology doing exceedingly well, uh, and uh, meat as well as milk, uh, both. And similarly, 44 breeds of sheep, and also some of those uh, camel breeds uh, which are identified. What is important is more than that, you know, not only promoting integrated systems of operation and farming uh, for enhanced income, but what is important is linking production to market and bringing in entrepreneurship to establish value chains. And uh, these entrepreneurs, young entrepreneurs are now incubated in our incubation centers. 30 uh, of those were there. Now we have increased to 50 of them. And these incubation centers are incubating young entrepreneurs and who are actually bridging the gap between production and consumption. And uh, the farmer producer organizations, 10,000 of them which are being established, they are producing and they are linked to the market through entrepreneurs and the processing value addition takes place in between. And that is how newer technology, digital platforms are being mainstreamed uh, to address the problems of dry land farm. So not just production, but also their a, a excess production is linked to the market by right. after uh, some value addition. So time is over. I will not go into those details, but that's what is very, very important. But there is need of more of investment. And of course, private investment partnership is very, very important. And the public-private partnership is not enough. The people's participation is also becoming very, very important. So public-private people partnerships are very, very important. And that's what we are actually now capitalizing on. So to summarize, what is important is that not only we recognize that the island uh, situation is very challenging, and has become more challenging under threats of climate change, and which is quite evident under uh, the uh, you know pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic. And given this uh, situation, uh, we are uh, you know are working in this direction to enhance uh, food and nutrition security in dry lands by way of developing newer varieties, biofortified climate resilient varieties for dry land ecologies. And we are also integrating crop system, field crop system with horticulture system, identified crop combinations to do well under dryland ecologies. At the same time, we're doing water harvesting and uh, micro irrigation systems implemented in dryland ecologies so that the challenges are met and water needs are actually met. And at the same time, we are integrating with the small ruminant agriculture so that the nutritional needs uh, are made through diversified diet system, not just through biofortified crop system. And uh, those crops and animal systems are identified 
and they are being promoted. And what we are also doing is bridging the gap between production and consumer uh, and consumption and uh, through entrepreneurship. And that is what is very, very important. And uh, you know, our partnership is very important as it has been said. And someone mentioned, one of the panelists mentioned uh, the role of women in this. And we have an institution, Women in Agriculture, that's one of its kind in the world. And we are not just documenting the women's role in agriculture, but also trying to develop technology, reduce drudgery, and also mainstream uh, gender. Uh, and gender mainstreaming is so important in a country like India. And uh, that's what we're doing. And I believe in years to come. So there will be many more significant outcomes uh, uh, in, uh, in dry land ecosystem. And I have taken more time. And uh, there, are, there are many things to, sp uh, to be spoken about. But instead of taking more time, I thank you very much for giving you, uh, giving me uh, time, Dr. Rajiv, and uh, uh, thanks to all the participants who are attending this particular program. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir, for all these interventions. It's always great to listen to you, and you have covered the whole value chain, starting from the crops, livestock, through the water, digital agriculture, gender. I think all these things. What. ICR and SA State Agriculture Universities have been doing under your leadership. We greatly appreciate. Thank you very much once again for your contribution to this very important meeting. Now, finally, we would like to have one more panelist and in who is Dr. Arvind Kumar. He is our Deputy Director General Research at Equisat. And as all of us know, and all these panelists mentioned that international organizations like Equisat and other CGR Institute and many other forums they play important role in the space of food and nutrition security. And we are bringing Dr. Arvind Kumar, who is the DDG research. He leads and provides a strategic direction to increase that research in the area of climate resilience, nutrition, crop improvement, genomic trade development, crops, water, soil, disease management, policy, agribusiness, market linkages, and capacity development for increase and mandate crops. Most grown mostly in the semi arid tropic regions of the world. So, we are very much excited to have you, Arvind, and we would like to invite you now for your interventions. Meanwhile, we can see several questions in this question and answer session. And I would like to request our panelists if they would like to answer some of those questions there. This will be great because we will have limited time, but nevertheless, I would invite some of those panelists also to answer some of the questions live as well. And I request attendees to type their questions in that Q&A uh, sections. Again, so uh, yeah, so thank you very much, Arvind, for joining us. Now, floor is yours. And I think the Nilesh is going to have his project, your presentation on. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Rajiv. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to uh, people who are attending this uh, uh, event, side event, Enabling Food and Nutritional Security for Drylands a side event for the Borlog Dialogue on the eve of the World Food Prize uh, Foundation, from the side of the World Food Prize Foundation. I also take this opportunity to thank uh, Dr. Yemi, Dr. Julian, Dr. Jain, and Do Dr. Mahapatra for expressing their views and the knowledge uh, with the audience, which has been quite enormous and a lot of, uh, it brings a lot of benefit to us. And it also makes uh, my task uh, very easy. On behalf of ICRISET, I will be talking about enhancing productivity, nutrition, climate resilience, and income in drylands, and what uh, ICRISET is engaged into. Next. So we all know what are the, the constraints to agriculture in the dryland. And I think uh, there are enormous constraints. And with the climate change, these constraints are increasing. But I would like to mention some, and which uh, many of the, the the four of the speakers they have mentioned. One is the low productivity, large yield gaps, weak seed system, poor nutrition, water scarcity, land degradation, nutrient depletion, poor mechanization, poorly functional input and output market, underdeveloped value chains, and poor capacity and knowledge. And also we, we have uh, this lack of SS2 women youth oriented technology. ICRISAT as an institution, uh, work to address these and many other challenges in the dryland areas of Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And I will be bringing some of the work that uh, ICRISET has, uh, has been doing over the years. Next. Uh, 
for improving productivity, as Dr. Mahapatra mentioned, that this is one of, one area where the crop improvement has to to has to have enormous contribution. And I remember whenever I talked to him, he most of the time he mentions that how we are going to have a quantum jump in the yield of the millets and the the legumes on which the set works. So we are engaged into product profile driven targeted breeding. We are engaged into using the genetic resources, creating the genetic variability through use of the gene bank, the wild relatives and the mutation. And in fact, uh, the earlier speakers have mentioned about set contribution in the genomics. I was so happy to hear. You know, we, we have done tremendous work in the area of the genomic whether it is creating the reference genome, pan genome, gene expression, genotyping arrays, or also better understanding of the crop genomes, development of the markers, diagnostic markers, QC panel, and high throughput genotyping platforms. We just didn't develop these technologies, but we have used this technology together with the number of partners, especially in India and Africa, where we have used these uh, genomic technologies, shared these knowledge, and have demonstrated in into the breeding. We also work towards uh, using the novel breeding approaches, uh, not only combining the molecular breeding with the standardized phenotyping, but we are moving towards prediction-based breeding, also accumulation of the superior haplotypes. And of course, the mainstream nutrition, climate resilience, and biotic stress resistance in breeding of all the crops that we do. And of course, we have followed the standardized multi-location testing, and we take data-driven uh, decisions to promote better high-yielding varieties. Rajiv mentioned that for our work over the years, in 2021, we have been recognized with the, uh, with the award Africa Food Prize, and we feel proud that we work with a number of partners in both Asia and Africa. Uh, although we got the award for Africa, but we did quite good amount of work in India and Bangladesh also on, on the legumes for which uh, we benefited more than 25 million farmers. Next one. The, the work that uh, we did towards uh, the, the, the yield gap, closing the yield gap. Uh, I just put this, uh, the figure that you can see that how much is the yield gap, the yield that we get on the station and the yield that the farmers get. And in fact, there are large differences. If we can close these yield gaps, we will have tremendous increase in the production of the uh, of the the different millets and legumes on which we work. So we work towards participatory varietal evaluation demonstrations of the among the number of varieties that has system has released over the years. What is the best variety locally adapted? And in fact, we identify those varieties, and then we also work on that we have the quality seed available to the farmers. At least I see two three speakers talking about the the seed availability, the quality seed availability, and we work towards that. In fact, the legume project and also the, our millet project earlier was uh, based on the, the quality seed availability. And then we do the appropriate planning based on the climate and weather information. And then this combination of best variety and the best natural management technologies, we try to reduce this ill gap. It's a challenge, the challenge that we see in the drylands but we try our best to address the challenge that how best we can reduce this yield gap that we see at the research station and then on the farmer's field. Next one. And then uh, in the seed system, uh, we know that what the, the seed system and the other speakers have also talked about the seed system for the crops that we are working on are less, less developed. And in fact, uh, we need to ensure that there is a timely access of high quality seed of climate resilient, nutritious, nutritious high quality varieties. And we, we try to develop a sustainable formal and informal system in different countries. I was so happy to see the figures from Africa, some of the countries where we are working, we have seen improvement in the seed system and the access to the to seed. We also link digital information, digital market in the system with the seed. And we also mainstream the informal seed sector models working with the government, through the government, through the institutions, the country institutions, and we, we, we work with them and assist them to, to improve the seed system. We engage women to harness entrepreneurship opportunity in the seed sector, seed sector and we create uh, most needed linkages between public and private sector to strengthen, uh, strengthen the, the seed system. Next one. Uh, I believe 
in the drylands, water management is the entry of the success. It reduce good water management, we we won the half half work. And in fact, uh, we pioneered research on the water management in different countries. I put some example here. One is from the Bundelkhand region of India, where we worked over years. And in fact, uh, we not only reduces the farm loss, we also increase the cropping intensity. We with the water management and the water conservation, we you can bring the horticultural vegetable, the fruit crops, and you can create the value chain. And that will lead to the, the doubling the farmer income. I put one example, next one, which, can I have the next slide? In Bundel countries, and we have been working over the last four and a half years. And we started with the water management. And we, we saw that that's the path that enables increasing the farmer's income. And we were guided here by the government of India's uh, a promise of doubling the farmer income over the last four and a half years. We are nearly there. I have asked the Equiset people that, you know, we not only reduce the crop failure of 10,000 farming families on which we have worked, we not only increase the productivity, we not only reduce the cost of cultivation by our interventions, but we also uh, improved the income of the farmer. We also help increase the groundwater availability. And in fact, it went to not only to improve the productivity, but also the milk, milk production. As of now, we have been told that, you know, the, we have in, enhanced the income of the farmers by 40 to 140%. But I asked them to, talk, to also find out about how much increase in milk production we have done because of the introduction of the, the fodder crops. And they are working on this. I, I tell, I have high hopes that in the end of the five years, we will be able to report to government of India that in the drylands, this is an one example where we have nearly doubled the income of the farmers by bringing all the interventions which Dr. Mahapatra was talking, most, most of the interventions which Dr. Mahapatra have been talking about. Next one, land degradation and uh, nutrient depletion is the another problem. And we all know that how big this problem is, mostly in the Africa, but also in the drylands of India. We work towards, in Africa, we work towards the bioreclamation bio of the degraded land. In India, even in the Bundelkhand, we worked, and also in Africa on the field bunding, bringing the agroforestry, bringing the crop rotation of the cereal millets and legumes, and also bringing the soil test based nutrient application, and also a small farm mechanization through the custom hiring centers. And we see some good example, the, the photo that you the see here, is of the Bundelkhand where we have brought the bunding and you can see that how this has improved, uh, improved the, reduced the line degradation and also the nutrient depletion. Next one. Uh, we, as we said that uh, the income needs to be increased, income will increase only when we bring the diversification and intensification. We use digital agriculture, we use GIS and remote sensing to map and identify stable areas for identification. And then we bring the, the, the appropriate crop and their appropriate varieties. And in fact, we have been able to increase the cropping intensity. Uh, we also practice the soil health mapping and soil test-based integrated management practices. We bring the short duration, stress tolerant climate resilient variety, not only of our crops. If you have to work on the landscape level, you have to see also that which crop and which variety of the previous. So we also provide uh, the, the advice to farmers that you should grow this variety of the crop which, which you grow in the wet season. I, I put here two examples on the digital agriculture on which it is that has been working with the government of India and several partners. One is the Megdut, where we partner with the government of India and provide the weather forecast to, to number of cities. And the other is Plantix, where we work with number of partners in fact, for, for controlling the disease uh, of not only set crop, crops, but beyond. The number of crops uh, and more than 500 diseases of 35 crops. Next one. We, we work towards the value chain development. And this is where we see that if we have, bring, if need, we need to, if we have to bring the holistic uh, improvement in the income of the farmers, uh, this has to go to the full cycle and value chain development is the, the, 
last but one step towards that. We not only work towards improving the nutrition in the dry lands, developing healthy and nutritious food products. And uh, there was one speaker talking about the smart food. So we work towards that, but we also work towards addressing the malnutrition and making accessible, affordable, nutritious and, dynamic, and hygienic food. But also we partner with, we cannot do it alone. We partner with the number of regional and national governments and non-government organizations in Asia and Africa for on value addition, strengthening local value chain and addressing malnutrition. Few of the activities that we do is the capacity building and skill development program for farmers, implementing a collectivization and value addition business models. And you see some of the examples where the government of India has recognized us as the Ministry, Ministry of Travel Affairs as the, the center of excellence, uh, excellence for, for uh, uh, center, center of excellence for the value addition. And also we, we handhold and mentor the startup and also the farmers, farmers producing organizations. And we have implemented several of these in, in Asia and some also in Africa. Next one. We work uh, for us, women and youth oriented technology will bring the success to agriculture in time to come. And we work towards that. We not only unveil the gender and youth nations in research for development, but we also try to understand that what is their need and how we can reduce the drudgery for them in the, in the agriculture. And in fact, we, we develop then gender appropriate technologies that we try to implement and we assess women and youth led pathways towards the food system transformation. And we also work towards strengthening their capacity. Next one. Last slide from our, our side is on knowledge and capacity development, which is the, one of the strong arm on which we believe that we partner with number of institutions and we can make bigger gains than, than as an institution alone we can make. We work with number of partners to create future research leaders, the scholars, the scientists, the national agriculture research system, private sector partners, farmers, extension workers, seed agency, government, and civil society with the aim to achieve impact at a scale that requires a strategic and demand-driven capacity development. With this, I thank all the participants for providing their time and, and participating in this event. Thank you very much, organizers, Rajiv and uh, the other program directors for also including me into this important session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arvind, for highlighting these different areas and also Equisat's contribution. I think these are really very, very important. And uh, uh, thank you very much once again and for all your help in organizing this event. I know that we have limited time now, but I was very happy because we wanted to have some panel uh, session or interaction, but I'm very happy to see many questions and suggestions raised by the participants have already been answered in the chat box. So thanks to all those panelists who have answered, but we would like to take three, four quick questions. And I would like to request each panelist not to take one more than one minute time so that we can have some quick questions and answers. And we have the panelists and also all other co-organizers. So we can invite some of them to answer those questions. And first question quickly to Julian, and this is about the global partnership. And there is a question that we are fully aware that par partnership is the only way forward. What are the specific plans or thoughts of donors to leverage on the long standing established partnerships like Department of Agriculture Research at in Myanmar? And I know that ACR was working on this aspect. So would you like to say something quickly, Julian? Sure, it's it's hard to speak speak on that quickly, but um, I will try. Um, I guess um, broadly looking internationally about partnerships, I'm hoping that we'll all look back on this year, uh, a year of UN Food System Summit and COP26, and realise that this was a pivotal year where we really took partnerships to the next level. But talking down, I guess at a country level in a country like Myanmar. Um, which is a difficult place for us to operate at the moment. We're really valuing the partnership that we have with organizations 
that have a presence there because we can't travel um, in Australia. I know other countries have begun travel, but we we still have quite strict travel restrictions. So through COVID, we've found great value in organisations that have a physical presence in country. And this means that we've actually changed some of the ways that we've been working um, in that we are trying to push more towards um, Global South, Global South collaboration. So Global South leadership of projects um, and also partnership um, rather than partnering as much with Australian uni universities or other institutions trying to foster partnerships in country or with other countries. Um, but in Myanmar, um, one of the great values has been that we're operating through multilateral organisations in that space because the Australian government has limited our ability to directly connect with institutions in that country. So without partners um, like ICRASAT, we wouldn't have been able to continue our activities there. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. May I request all panellists and co-hosts to open their videos so that we can keep on having the questions, quick questions. And now my next question is to Ravi Harawa, who is also our co-organizer. Though this question was answered by Julian, but we would like to have some feedback from Ravi. Question is, how do you think that how women are effective in developing countries, especially in agriculture and food system? What is your take on this, Ravi? Uh, thank you very much, Rajiv. Uh, first of all, I think uh, there is, evidence that uh, equality and women empowerment in food system uh, will certainly result uh, in uh, better food and nutrition and also resilient and sustainable system. Uh, there is evidence that uh, today, I think women are the key actors of every part of the food system, particularly here in developing countries like uh, Africa and uh, when you look at the statistics, you have 60 to 80% of the uh, women actually involved in food production. Uh, one third of SMEs are actually uh, women. Now, what is critical is to really make them more effective. We need to empower them. I think we have heard from the panelists, the key areas that are really missing. For example, we need to make sure that women, they have better seeds, uh, good quality seeds, but they also need to come with technologies that can be able to reduce their drudgery. For example, uh, what we have just said, what we are doing in ICRISAT in making sure that technologies like seeds, they go with better mechanization, but we, there is also the aspect of processing and value addition. We also need to make sure that there is access to markets. Women, they are the ones, if they get money, they'll make sure that priority gives gets to food and nutrition security at the households. And these are the critical areas that we need to make sure that women, we are empowering them in order for them to be effective in these food systems. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ravi. Very nicely put these things. Now I would like to request Anthony and very quick question. And this is about that. How can we minimize the use of synthetic fertilizers in semi-arid and dry land regions. Okay, thanks Rajiv. Um, well, minimizing the use of synthetic fertilizers should be a, an important aim in all our work in farming systems. In practical terms, many of the soils in the semi-arid are, are degraded. So they've been degraded through years of overuse and they're often infertile. So to produce resilient, um, nutritious crops and forages, we need to put in some kind of external inputs these don't necessarily have to be synthetic fertilizers. They can be often uh, organic inputs as well. However, many of our soils are deficient in nutrients such as phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, and micronutrients, which we often can't supply with um, only organic sources. Um, in all cases, I think the application of organic and inorganic fertilizers is a possibility and must be driven by things like understanding soil fertility, placing the nutrients at the right place at the right time, and also conservation and restoration of soils through best practices. So I'll stop there, thanks. Thank you, thank you, Anthony. Uh, one question to Jane, and this question is because I think this is related to your work, that what steps have been taken so far by the different governments in closing up the seed system gaps, considering that Uganda seemed to be the performing better, and what program learnings can the 
can we can other countries uh, take and adopt it jane would you like to answer yeah thank you very much uh, the question relates to uh, why some countries are doing better others are not uh, well they they are not doing as good but what i can say is that in all the countries what is needed is first the right diagnosis of the what is missing that's like the system elements because you know not all countries are at the same level in the research in the seed production and even in the distribution if you look at countries which are doing fairly well actually there's a lot of investments which has gone in in kenya in uganda we angra for example we invested heavily in training scientists more than 600 scientists to the MSc and PhD level. I mean, across the countries that we are working in. ICRISAT has invested so much in training and building the capacity. We have also supported breeding, you know, and variety release and supporting even seed companies. So one of the things that the government needs to do, first of all, is to have good policies because without the right policies, we cannot have good environment for seed business. If you look at these countries, which are fairly and, and, and uh, advanced actually, the government has good policies for liberalization, you know, in the seed industry. And uh, we need our development partners as well, support, because all these things need resources, they need financing, they need support in training, they need to target the right groups, just like has been seen, like ready. And so, yeah, so there's a lot of investments which are, is actually needed. So really it is just advancing and scaling up these models and ensuring that the governments are as involved as partners, because Thank resources you. are really needed. Thank you very Thank much, you. Jane. Thank you very much. Uh, next question, I think I would like to ask Ramjita to answer. And Ramjita, question is that although we have learned from this session, there are many high yielding varieties, varieties are released, but even then, why is the yield gap so large in the dryland regions? And what are the major contributing factors to such large yield gaps, or maybe that how we can make some intervention? You have been working in Western Central Africa for a long time, Ramjita. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, uh, Rajiv. Yeah, why uh, the improved varieties are not being adopted by the smallholder farmers in Africa? I think we go back to the issue of seeds. Uh, we have uh, developed those varieties. The seeds are available, but they're not affordable to the smallholder farmers because they have to buy them uh, and uh, they don't have the resources to buy them. Now, uh, the other issue is really that of the fertilizer. You know, uh, we, to exploit uh, this potential of those uh, materials, you need to apply fertilizer. Again, the prices of fertilizer are so high that the smallholder farmers in sub-Saharan Africa uh, are not able to afford that. Uh, we have tried what we call the warrantage system, the inventory credit and the fertilizer microdosing, which have made the use of fertilizer a bit high and also uh, promoted uh, or enhanced the adoption of crop varieties, but this is really quite limited. I think we need more investment into uh, agricultural research, as uh, uh, Jane or somebody has said. I think yeah. we need to uh, uh, empower the women. We need to get the youth back to uh, agriculture. We, there's a lot of accompanying measures that the governments have to do, the policies, uh, make things available to them, link them to markets uh, to ensure that those varieties are, are uh, adopted by farmers. I will go on and on, but I think I will stop here because yes. there's so many challenges. Yeah. Thank you, Ramjita. And I think another question I would like to ask Michael Hauser, and this is about that, uh, this is especially in the Indian context, that but economics related thing. The question is purchasing power of majority of Indian, which disable them to have fruits and vegetables in their daily diets. World's largest number of malnourished people are in India. Kindly suggest how to increase the purchasing power of people. Well, um, thanks, thanks, Rep Chief. I, I guess the, the question is not only relevant for India; it's, it's relevant for all um, um, uh, for the entire global stars, in, including including Africa. Uh, also in East Africa, where I'm calling from, uh, millets are more expensive than than the basic staples. Um, so the economist would say, well, um, high cost of production, low economy of scale, high price, low demand. So 
well, that's that's the that's the short answer. But it, it's more to, than that. It's the underpin, underpinning reason is, is is income poverty, and and if we understand that, then the, even the smartest crops won't won't help us if people can't access these crops. So we must understand that we're dealing with a systems challenge. Uh, and I, I see three starting points. I'm sure on this call there are more people who have many additional starting points. But but here there's three. One, one is to understand the political economy that makes some crop cheap and others more expensive. And uh, Jane hinted on that already um, in, in her talk. Second, uh, really it's necessary to increase the demand and support uh, the, this demand by consumers financially. Yeah? Uh, and one way of doing so is, is through cash transfers, especially in, in emergencies um, that, that we do frequently have. School feeding programs is, is another uh, an entry point and, and enabling physical access to nutrition density crops uh, on, on markets. I believe we should really uh, not have to search for nutrition density crops on market. Uh, they should wave at us as the beverages wave at us when we when we drive through rural areas. Uh, three and last, reward nutrition sensitive farming, uh, and that means to move beyond productivity uh, to profitability and make make nutrition sensitive farming profitable. Andre van Rooyen, uh, my colleague um, from the program, has just with colleagues published a paper in Nature Food on on that issue that we have to go beyond the lead gap. Yeah. Um, and and that would help steering the policies into the right direction. Uh, Rajiv, is that easy? Uh, I say no, no, it's not easy because it's really transformational change that we are talking about here. Yeah, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. And I think we will take two, three more questions and we will close the session. I think I can address or, or direct this question to Dr. Mohopatra. And sir, there is a question that when you mentioned about the biofortification, then basically this is the process of increasing the micronutrient content of food crop. There are many methods, selective breeding, genetic modification, or the use of enriched fertilizers. In your opinion, which approach is more effective or people should be using? Uh, <laughs> anyway, so... <clears throat> See, first of all, uh, I would emphasize for better nutrition outcomes, there has to be diverse diet system. And uh, that's what is more important. We have quite diverse food items in this country and globally. And traditionally, that has been uh, the way. So to address malnutrition, that could be the first, first and foremost approach. Second one, I would suggest that, uh, you know, when you talk of biofortified crops, uh, it is not just, uh, you know, growing in uh, crops in isolation. Obviously, uh, the nutrient requirements of biofortified crops uh, are to be met adequately. So the, the soil system has to be corrected. And if there are deficiencies there, so it would also uh, you know, impact uh, crop nutrition. So, so that's a fundamental issue, and uh, you would need to really address from the soil till the plant, and uh, obviously uh, the produce uh, which is harvested is uh, nutritionally dense. But more important is that having a biofortified uh, produce is one thing, but how do you really supply adequate uh, quantity uh, to address uh, malnutrition? Uh, it has been already addressed briefly that, uh, uh, you know, unless we have uh, purchasing power, you will not be able to purchase. But uh, two ways we can address, that's what is being done in India. One is that, uh, you know, um, you have uh, through government uh, system, or what we call as a public distribution system, uh, supply those, uh, you know, mainstream those through public distribution system all through to the school children and midday meal system to the schools. So, so these are uh, ways that you can provide uh, uh, even free okay. or at the subsidized rates, biofortified uh, food to the, uh, you know, staple food uh, to the majority of the population. The other is you distribute free. If you have plenty and your economy allows, distribute free and enable those who are uh, not having the appropriate, uh, you know, uh, purchasing power. Uh, or enable them, as it was said, that uh, by way of uh, providing uh, monetary support, financial mm -hmm. support. 
So they have already said. So I think uh, you know the approach is that uh, better nutrition outcomes would not come. I have already said yes. just from better food, nutritious food. So one need to have uh, you know proper uh, uh, drinking water, other sanitation measures, and which the government of India is putting in place. So obviously, so this is the outcome of several other things. Okay. So 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 I will stop here. So thank uh, you. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for very good, uh, yeah, providing your suggestions and directions. I think we will take two more questions only, and one is to Yami. And Yami, this question is related to Africa, of course. That nutrition. So they say that one major issue is that in Africa, nutrition security is emphasized in most policies as a major challenge, but it seems often diluted within the broad food security agenda. how can we make sure that nutrition is specifically tackled and not confounded with other challenges so will appreciate your answer in brief yami i know that very good question <laughs> right thank you very much and um um that's a very interesting question i will answer it by saying one um we started off by identifying food secure food insecurity and then by and large the whole issue of hidden hunger and the associated um, conditions elicited the whole question around nutrition security so what has african governments and research institutions what have they done i will say this in brief 2010 the late president of um, malawi president mutharika at the time was the chair of the african union commission and it was in realization of the fact that it is important to keep africa not just food secure but also nutrition secure that as a legacy of his presidency or the chairmanship of the union he initiated the africa day for food and nutrition security so from a policy um point of view since 2011 every year there has been the commemoration of food and nutrition security to heighten their awareness now this is as far as it can get when it comes to raising awareness from the policy end but there are lots of other stakeholders from a global perspective there is the games the global alliance for um nutrition uh, i mean there there's so many son the scaling up nutrition there are so many of this kind of um of awareness creation that are addressing the issue of nutrition at grassroots level so we know that this is a challenge and there are so many other um ways of um raising this i mean trying to deal with this situation at the grassroots thank you thank you very much yami thank you I think the last question I would like to request Arvind, and this is more related to Ikrisat, and I have little bit moderated this question. They say that today we learned that uh, still we have more than a billion people going to bed hungry, and most of those living in the semi-arid tropic regions where Ikrisat has been working, and now Ikrisat will be approaching its 50th anniversary. This is really good that even yeah, so they. I know that Ikrisat is going to celebrate 50th anniversary next year. So, question to you, Arvind, is, and I already highlighted that I think this makes Ikrisat role much more relevant in the coming years. But we would like to ask you, as a DDGR, what you would like to say that how Ikrisat is going to tackle these challenges in coming years, so that we can really contribute in this important area in this direction. I think you need to unmute Arvind. Uh, thank you for this question. Ikrisat believes in science of discovery to science of delivery, and this is where we are going to strengthen our effort. Uh, we know the problem, but we also know that just by working on our crops, we will not bring the holistic development in the drylands. So we have started targeting. that we work at the land scape level to improve the system productivity of the drylands that includes not only the productivity of the our crop 
but also bringing vegetables, fruits, oilseed crops, agroforestry, livestock, and this become part of the, the whole dry land approach. In future, we will work very more closely with the different governments and the institutions in the dry lands to ensure that we bring that holistic improvement of the system productivity in the dry lands so that we ensure that in time to come, no farmer goes hungry to the bed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Arvind. This is a very positive approach. And I think this also highlights that international donors investment, partnership, and all these areas which other colleagues highlighted, this is very, very important. And as they say that this is the global issues. And I think that we all need to work in collaboration. All these global actors need to come together and need to address these important issues. So with these words, and I know that we already have taken 20 minutes extra, but it's really exciting to see that there are more than 300 people are still associated with us. So this topic is really very relevant, very important. So we, there are several important questions. We cannot take, unfortunately, those questions. I'm sorry about that. But nevertheless, I think that we need to close this session now. And I think that uh, we, we really had very productive session. And I think that this session has provided all of us a better understanding about this important topic, food and nutrition security in dryland regions. All of our panelists and also our co-organizers, they really shared their wisdom, their vision. And also we had really very, very good questions and suggestions from our audience. And I could see from the names, there are really very many of our collaborators, well-wishers, and they are there. And they have long-term collaborators. So I think we really had the good understanding on these topics. In my view, I personally got very much benefited, but I hope that the researchers who have joined this session, they, were, they will be able to develop a good roadmap. Policymakers, I think they have been able to make or to understand, appreciate the importance of the good investment, partnership, et cetera. And I'm sure the young generation by listening all of those eminent panelists is inspired. And I think this is one of the other important topic area on which World Food Price Foundation work that how we can ignite, how we can inspire the young generation. So with these words, I would like to close this panel session, but before that would like to thank the World Food Price Foundation for giving us this opportunity to organize this interesting session. And on this occasion, we would like to thank the leadership of ICRISAT, especially our Director General, Dr. Jacqueline Hughes, our Deputy Director General Research, Dr. Arvind Kumar, for providing all the support and all the co-organizers who are here to organize this event. And as I said earlier, this the credit for this success goes to the eminent panelists who are accomplished scientists, policymakers, research leaders, and administrators. So we are very much Thankful to all of you. And from ICRISAT side, many colleagues, in, especially Nilesh Mishra and Prashad Bajaj, they have been helping us. Communications department under the leadership of Raman Pichoy has provided great support. And several colleagues from their department, they really made this thing very much successful. So with these words, thank you very much, one and all. And thanks to all audience that uh, to join this meeting. And uh, we really appreciate all your time. And I know that for many of you, this is really not a good time. I know for Julian, this should be midnight there, but you are here. So thank you very much. And I think the same thing for many other participants and the panelists. We are grateful to one and all. Thank you very much. Thanks once again. And have a nice day, nice evening and good night. Thank you very much once again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye, thank you very everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.